Hey, Brendo, Steve here. Welcome back to the channel. So it's once again time to react to your hot takes. I love doing this. I'm going to try to get it done on the weekly because you guys have so many takes, some hotter maybe than others, but uh, a whole ton of you. I put this up and then like a couple hours later, you guys had like just a ton of these things. And the thing that I love is when you go through and you give that thumbs up to the takes that you agree with or the takes that you want me to respond to or react to here on the channel. There's one of these takes that has like 75 thumbs up and I love that because then it means, hey, I, you guys really want me to talk about this or you just really agree with it. And uh, and it's always fun to talk about that. But we're gonna start off, we're gonna get that one in a second. Let me start that off with this one. It only has one thumbs up, but it's an interesting one. I've seen it on Twitter lately. And it's from DJ Solo. He says, late 96, early 97, Heel Stone Cold is the best version of his character. So uh, the thing that I like about a take like this is it allows me the opportunity to go and do a little bit of research. So I watched, watched a couple of segments from late 96, early 97 in the big lead up to uh, number one, the Royal Rumble, but also to that WrestleMania match with Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret Hart. And it's kind of interesting. There was a Monday Night Raw where Stone Cold Steve Austin took on Vader. They weren't booking Stone Cold nearly as strong as they did after the big WrestleMania match with him and Bret Hart. But uh, uh, they, they did like a DQ finish where Bret Hart, who was watching at ringside because he was in a feud with Steve Austin, comes over and Stone Cold gets thrown out of the ring and he puts him in a sharpshooter and he won't let go and everybody's trying to get him to let go. And it sort of foreshadows the uh, WrestleMania match between him and Bret Hart. I thought it was really good stuff. But honestly, if you go back and you look at his promos, when he really first cracked the Stone Cold character, they're not quite as polished as they ended up being like a year, two years, like 25 years later. Um, but there's something kind of special about that. There's that raw energy that he was bringing to this character because he really knew the character. It was just a matter of getting him reps on the mic as that character. And obviously, as we all know, he ended up becoming like probably the best talker ever uh, to do it. So um, interesting take here. I can agree with uh, definitely parts of it. There, there was that energy, that thing where you're just, you know, this dude is hungry and he's not there yet. And he doesn't know if he's going to get there, but obviously, obviously he got there. Anyways, let's go ahead and take a look at this next one. He got like a ton of thumbs ups from Nick. My hero says, as I get older, I find it more entertaining to talk about wrestling than to actually watch it. It might just be me, but I love seeing these stories play out. But when watching the actual shows, I find myself paying more attention to my phone than the match. This got 75 thumbs ups, which I was uh, thumbs up, which I thought was really, really interesting. So I looked at some of the responses here. Maserati Merrick says, I could totally agree with this comment. Uh, Home Malone says, the matches are 100% the most boring part of wrestling. Promos, finishes, and intros are in that order the best part. Uh, let's see here. Chili Chad says TV matches have been rendered pointless. Pay-per-view premium live event matches are usually way more worth watching. Jojo says, I enjoy watching Steven Larson more than wrestling as a whole. And that says a lot. So this is kind of an interesting thing in that I got to break down. What do I personally enjoy more? Do I enjoy watching the wrestling more than, for example, reviewing it afterwards with Larson, which is essentially where I get to talk to my best friend about what we saw. We get to joke around about it. If there is unintentional humor, we'll probably end up joking around about it and having a good time breaking it down. Uh, they're two very different things, but it is interesting to me that I think a large part of the audience, um, be, like just looking at this and sort of understanding where people are coming from, so many pro wrestling matches by necessity follow for one thing, a certain pattern, a lot of them move, uh, you know, the, the, the sequences they do their muscle memory. This is what you go through when you go through wrestling training. And I'm look, I'm not saying this is somebody who's gone through wrestling training. I've seen enough footage of people going through wrestling training to understand that, uh, you know, you, you do an Irish whip you do the thing where you fall down and then you do the thing where you jump over the guy. Like there's all sorts of sequences that are just sort of inherent to the language of pro wrestling. And I think that's something that the audience for might take for granted. I think that's one reason why I think it was William Regal. People have said uh, when he trains his students, I think it was him uh, placed a heavy emphasis on the lockup 
Like if the lockup just feels really, really visceral and violent and, and, and as if these people are actually, you know, trying to fight each other, trying to jockey for position that can kick off a really, really good match and get people sucked in. So they actually pay attention to it and they're not watching their phones. That being said, I totally kind of understand Although I do appreciate the actual matches themselves. So, for example, if I'm watching like a normal episode of Monday Night Raw and we get, I don't know, man, like a Tommaso Ciampa versus a, a Giovanni Vinci match. I like Tommaso Ciampa a lot. I like Giovanni Vinci just fine. Is it going to be the most compelling thing in the world for 12 minutes? Probably not. Will I look at my phone a couple times? Probably. Now, if you took Champa versus like Gunther, for example, and put that on a premium live event, I'll actually watch the shit out of that. That's probably going to be a killer match. But on TV, yeah, I kind of feel like sometimes there are matches where you're like, oh, I kind of feel like I've seen a lot of what they're going to be doing here. So there's not a whole lot of now whenever there's somebody new like Kyrie Sane returns, I want to watch one of her matches. I know she didn't have the, like the greatest match with uh, uh, Bianca this past Friday, but uh, a lot of stuff she does is very interesting. Whenever there's new blood that comes in, I like to see how they're going to adapt that or bring that into the WWE main roster, whether it's a call from NXT or somebody coming back from, you know, somewhere else or somebody signing brand new with the company. Like, I would have been kind of interested to see what Will Ospreay would do with his moveset coming to WWE, how he would adapt it. Um, if he would try to, you know, given that his moveset is not exactly <laughs> altogether WWE friendly, how he would change it to still make it exciting, but go, you know, under the auspice of what WWE allows. Anyways, that was a tangent. Interesting take here. I don't a thousand percent agree with it, but I definitely agree with aspects of it. And, uh, and, and I appreciate that. So many of you seem to have the same feel about it. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. The Skippy McNew says AEW would become significantly more popular for available on streaming services in the way WWE is. If I could just sit down and watch a random AEW pay-per-view with dinner, I would watch them way more often. I think that's something that they're probably working on. I think it's something that they want to do. Um, but uh, but yeah, I kind of agree with it. There's a, a, another take a little bit further down the way. You guys left a ton. Like, look, there's 312 of these here. But somebody else also said the same thing, that, the, that AEW would grow significantly more if their entire catalog was available on streaming. I have no doubt that if I'm sitting here a year from now and AEW doesn't have a streaming service of some sort or a, a licensing deal to stream their stuff, I'd be pretty shocked. I think that's going to be a priority for 2024. Uh, let's see. Here's a good one. Uh, Riley, golly, come on, man. Here we go. Riley Parvin says, I honestly really like the 40 man Royal Rumble when they did it and wish they would do it every year, especially with how much the roster is swollen with quality talent last 10 years. Yeah, I kind of agree with this. Go to 40. Why do you need 20 or 30? It's 30 now. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. They have the depth in the women's division necessarily for 40. Maybe they do, but certainly in the men's division, they've got the depth for 40. Um, but, uh, yeah, what about this? How about this? A 30 tag team Royal rumble. You get 60 people in there. That might be a bit too much Two Jack Dolan says, I think getting rid of dark slash elevation has been an underrated negative. Having more matches for greener talent. That wasn't on national TV was a great resource and allowed for trial and error. That being on cable doesn't allow. I feel like that's what Ring of Honor does now, right? Ring of Honor has those same kind of matches. Like two hours, you get 20 matches. Most of them, you know what's going to happen. But they also incorporate stories specific to Ring of Honor. I kind of feel like that's why they shuttered Dark and Elevation. Because they wanted to do something similar with Ring of Honor to allow for more developmental talents to go there uh, and get the reps in that they need. Have some stories more than they had on Dark and Elevation um, and, and Paywall it. So I think I think they did that. I don't think they're really missing much by not having dark and elevation. So but uh, it's a good take. I love this one here because I totally agree with it. Jay Monteroso says, I think without the pandemic, John Cena versus the Fiend at WrestleMania 36 would have floundered possibly on one seven hour show with John getting up there in age as well. They wouldn't have done anything life changing like the Firefly Funhouse if it was a simple match. I a thousand percent agree. I think that the Firefly Funhouse was one of the very few positives that we got in the world of wrestling uh, from the pandemic. 
it forced the company to be a bit more creative with some of their stuff. Uh, and we got uh, the the Firefly Funhouse match, which I loved. It was probably my favorite piece of wrestling entertainment from that year. Uh, I'm not going to call it a match because it clearly wasn't a match, but it was definitely awesome. I loved it. I thought it was great. Really good take here. Here's a good one from Deadpool Nerd. says, Christian and Matt Hardy have always been the respective better half of their tag teams. Both men worked on character work and have the charisma, whereas Jeff and Edge relied for years on a young, edgy demo, so they seemed the coolest. Yeah, I don't know that I would necessarily consider Matt and Christian the better half. I think they're just very different. I think they bring something much more, much different to what to, to pro wrestling than the other guy does, which in my opinion is awesome because as tag teams, they complemented each other perfectly. But I never considered Christian a lesser version of Edge. I always thought that Christian actually had a greater knack for sort of the heel comedy stuff as opposed to Edge, who had just the vicious piece of crap vill uh, villain heel stuff. The, uh, the what do they call the ultimate opportunist stuff? So I just think they were very different. Um, right now, I feel like Christian's heel work, the father stuff, I think is probably the best stuff either Edge or Christian has ever done in their respective careers. Because I've never been like a big Edge Edge fan. Seems like a really nice guy. I always say that. But I've just never been a really big fan. I guess I liked some of the uh, the opportunist stuff back then. You know, the live sex show I thought was was pretty ballsy, so to speak. Um, Matt Hardy, just a creative genius. Like, obviously, this dude has reinvented himself a million times. He's always got ideas. And that's awesome. Whereas Jeff Hardy, you know, just had that aura that none of these other guys had. He had that thing. He had that aura um, that, uh, that like that real artistic aura, you know? So yeah, I don't know. They all brought something different, you know, it's, it's, that's all kind of subjective stuff. I honestly think that all four of them brought so much, so much to the table on their own, uh, that it'd be difficult to say who was better. It's just sort of a subjective thing. All right. I don't know about this one. Uh, Z Mick trick 5302 says, the fake Razor Ramon and Diesel was a good angle, entertaining as heck, and both performers did a great job in their impressions. It's often misremembered as Vince wanting to replace Hall and Nash when it was clearly a troll move from the beginning and it fit right in with JR's disgruntled employee storyline. So I agree that it is totally misremembered as, wait a second, Vince wanted to replace Hall and Nash? That's weird. Why would he have done that? That's silly. And maybe a little bit on the petty side. I do agree that it was intended as a troll situation, as it was JR was oddly a heel, disgruntled JR, and he was going to stick it to McMahon by bringing in his own version of Hall and Nash as sort of a troll. To what end, who knows, because it failed miserably. And then at a certain point, they did just sort of wheel them out as normal characters, and the troll job was finished, and then they were kicked back down to developmental, and then, then they were gone. Um, but uh, I don't know that I would consider it a good angle, though. It was a really, I, I kind of just think it was <laughs> kind of stupid, to be honest with you. I don't I, I don't know that I would call it good. I know it's all subjective and everything. Entertaining is like, here's the thing. I think something could be really stupid and silly and be entertaining. I think in this case, it was probably unintentionally entertaining. But I feel like they didn't go far enough with the troll aspect of it. Like if if they if Razor if the fake Diesel and the fake Razor played it up as a certain angle or with a certain angle as opposed to just trying to do a dead on impression of Hall and Ash, which is kind of what like fake Razor actually did a pretty decent Razor Ramon impersonation. It's just he looked nothing like Scott Hall, and unfortunately uh, Rick Bognar didn't have the natural just oozing charisma of uh, Scott Hall. So I don't know. I think something can be really bad and entertaining. Uh, and Jr. as a heel was just weird. But uh, I don't know. I like I like this take. I think it's I think it's pretty funny. Clever username says the wrestling locker room of today are filled with better human beings than the locker rooms from years past. I don't think this is much of a hot take. I think this is clearly true. And I don't know if anybody I don't know if anybody would ever disagree with this. Because if you look at the locker rooms of yesteryear, man, there was some shady ass shit going down back then. And these days, yeah, they're just nice. They seem 
Like they're kind of like nice people who play video games often. So I don't know, man. I, I kind of agree with this, but I don't know if many people would disagree with it. All right. Speaking of Edge and Christian and Matt Hardy and all that, Dream Crazy says Christian's run in AEW has been better than the rest of his career combined. He's better off solo as a patriarch of wrestling to where he can show off his heel charisma. While Edge and Christian were a great tag team, he's done more lately than Adam Copeland will ever do. Plus, is a better heel. Yeah, I, so like, I don't know necessarily this is a hot take. I think a lot of people are kind of underwhelmed by Edge's AEW run so far. Christian is doing career work. Um, and uh, and as far as it being better than his work in his total career combined, I still am a huge fan of Edge and Christian as a heel sort of slightly comedy act. The, f- the, the five second post stuff, I thought that was really, really good. I thought when they were doing stuff with Kurt Angle, I thought that was really, really good. But yeah, this this run in AEW has been absolutely spectacular for Christian. I am so glad he did not stay around or WWE didn't have anything for him to do because this is really good stuff. It elevates AEW. And uh, and yeah, I, I agree. I think this has been awesome. Okay, we're going to end this week on this one, although there's a lot more hot takes. I'll be getting to those on Monday. David Wondolowski says the Bloodline storyline has reached its Godfather Part 3 stage. It started out strong, but now it's just a cash grab. There have been multiple logical endings, and now they are stuck. I don't think they're stuck. I think they're in a lull, and I think that's different. However, this has been by far the biggest lull. It's anchored by Jimmy doing sort of a comedic heel tribal chief thing, which I think is highly entertaining, but it also feels like it's doing absolutely nothing right now, except for maybe trying to keep LA Knight relevant. The crowd still loves him, but it's kind of a nothing storyline. Why is he still involved with the bloodline? Um, and uh, and and yeah, it is sort of nothing because Roman Roman's just been gone for too long. Now I'm assuming he's going to be back on SmackDown at some point soon. I have not looked at any of the advertisements for next week or what's going on, but you would think Roman would show up at some point in advance of the Royal Rumble to face off with Randy Orton, because I think that that's going to be the match there. So, um, yeah, right now it's in a major, major lull. Hopefully at WrestleMania, they just do the damn thing where Cody wins the title off of Roman Reigns, and then they can move on and tell whatever next chapter. I think there's still stuff with these characters you can do. It's just clearly the bloodline has fallen apart. Rhea Ripley even says that the bloodline is crumbled. Um, and that's sort of, that's sort of, you can tell that's sort of the truth, especially with CM Punk showing up. If he's going to do some stuff with Paul Heyman, maybe there's some post title stuff that Roman Reigns can get into with CM Punk. I can, I think that could be a lot of fun. Maybe Reigns versus Punk without the title is going to be the SummerSlam match, assuming, you know, Punk remains healthy and on everybody's good terms. So that wasn't a shot. That was just how it is. That's going to do it for this episode of your hot takes. Thanks everybody for submitting them. The thread is still open. There's still there's still plenty of takes uh, that that could be thumbs up. So please do me a solid. Go over to the community tab of this channel. Go through the hot takes that I haven't talked about in this video yet and give your thumbs up to other takes that you want to hear me discuss or that you agree with. That would be awesome because it'll make my job easier. Uh, Yeah. And then go hit that thumbs up, subscribe button, all that good stuff here we do on YouTube.